Hi, folks. Roland Martin here. You know, <clears throat> over the years, I get asked a lot of questions about different tournaments and stuff. And one of the craws in my throat is uh, the fact that I never won a Bassmaster Classic. Now, I set records on Angler of the Year titles, and I set records on, on winning regular tournaments, but I never won a Bassmaster Classic. The best I ever did, I came in second. I came in third one time. I came in fourth one time. But I never actually won one. And I'm thinking back of about five or six times, and I got them listed right here, that just one little teeny decision would have won me the tournament. One little teeny five-minute little deal would have, would have won me the tournament. But yet, I made a wrong choice. You know, tournament fishing or any kind of fishing is a matter of making the right choices. And I'm a pattern fisherman. I look for those exact set of water and cover conditions. I'm pretty good at finding fish. But you don't always take into account the other fishermen that are on the lake. Now, see, that's the problem with the classic. In almost all the cases that I'm going to mention now, it wasn't my pattern that messed up. It was my fact that I didn't factor in the fact of the other fishermen coming in and catching those same fish. So anyway, that's, that's kind of the situation. Well, the first one was the very first Bassmaster Classic we ever had was at uh, Lake Mead, Nevada. And it was so cool because I was working for Ray Scott. I was actually a part of the Bluebird bus team, and we were doing a seminar tour. We did 102 cities from Connecticut to California. And as we went across the, the country, we stopped in Las Vegas, Nevada. And Scott was there, and he, he said, let's spend the whole week here. He somehow or other canceled it, and he met this guy by the name of Dave Newton. Now, Dave Newton was the head of the Las Vegas Tourism Bureau, and it was some kind of a big deal on, on a raising, arranging different events for Las Vegas. And so they were thick as thieves, and they are talking all the time. Well, in the meantime, we did a big seminar in Las Vegas. This was way before the tournament now. This is like six or eight months before the tournament. And I said, and I met some guys and said, I want to go fish Lake Mead. I've heard, heard a lot about Lake Mead. So I told Ray, I said, hey, in the morning, I'm going to go fish Lake Mead. And so Ray said, no, 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 you can't fish Lake Mead. See, I didn't know that he had made arrangements with Dave Newton about setting up the whole classic. See, it was a mystery deal at the time. See, back at the first couple, five or six years that we had tournaments and we had classics, it was a mystery deal. We'd get on a plane, it would fly up in the air, and he'd announce, Ray would announce, well, today our mystery lake is such and such. It would be 10,000 feet in the air when he'd announce it. So anyway, at that point, it was the very first tournament, and he had planned this, this mystery lake flight to Las Vegas, and, 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 and he was arranging with Dave Newton all the different things about getting the tournament all set up. Well, in the meantime, I was, I was talking to all these local fishermen, and they wanted to take me fishing. And every time, two days in a row, I said, hey, I'm going to go fish in the morning. No, no, hey, I get you, you got to do something else for me. you got to take care of this other thing. And so he made me do other things because I was working for Ray. And so I never got a chance to fish Lake Mead. I thought it was kind of strange. I thought it was real strange. And then I got to thinking, he hired Dave Newton. Dave Newton came to work for him in, in Montgomery, Alabama. And I'm thinking, wait a minute here, there's something going on, and it's possible that maybe Lake Mead is going to be the lake. But I couldn't get out there and fish, and so what difference does it make? We got there. We got to 10,000 feet. We're flying out of Montgomery, Alabama, and Ray opens a thing, Lake Mead, Nevada. We flew out to Nevada. Well, it so happens that we have a lot of friends in the tournament circuit, like Bobby Murray, who won the tournament, who's kind of my roommate. He was kind of my confidant. He was my fishing partner for the most part. And he would share information. So we got to Lake Mead. The boats didn't arrive. See, see, I'm going way back now. Forest Wood had been a big supporter, and a range of boats had been a big supporter of all the tournaments. But that particular April, just before the tournament, now this is the same year that the tournament was, the, the plant burnt down. I was there in Flippin. I was at the range of boat plant when, when the thing burst into flames, and the whole thing burned up. And so he didn't have any boats. The uh, Forest Wood was out of boats. I mean, we spent the whole night trying to get records out of the office, which we did. And uh, my boat I'd brought in for to some repairs. It was way off the, uh, off away from it, so it didn't get burned up. Only a half a dozen or so boats survived the, the whole wreck and the whole fire. So anyway, the tournament came along, and there was a new Rebel boat. It was an inboard, outboard piece of junk that... Ray had contracted it for 26 of them because there were 26 people coming to the 
first Bassmaster Classic. And I was the angler of the year that year. So I was the head boat number one. I had boat number one. Well, it was an inboard outboard boat. Anyway, we get there and they hadn't arrived. Only half the boats got there. So the one day that we had to practice, I had to get in the boat with Bob Ponds. And Bob Ponds is a, a weather uh, uh, announcer out of Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, he has a son, uh, uh, Ponds. I forget Ponds' his first name, but he, he, he's a pro fisherman now. Uh, anyway, Bob's son does a lot of, a lot of good, a good fishing. But anyway, Bob and I teamed up and we went up to Colville Bay that first morning. There were big willow trees. The water had come up real high and there were willow trees, salt cedars, actually. They weren't really willows. They were salt cedars. In the, and I had polarized glasses and one thing that I was always looking for was shallow fish. And I could look back into the, into the willows, way underneath the branches in the shade, I'd see bass laying back there. And I'd say, Bob, there's some bass laying back there. So I put together kind of a single spinnerbait on about a half ounce head, and I'd come up to a willow tree, this is in practice now, and I'd throw it over in, in the thing and kind of dabble it through there and drop it down through the limbs, and bass would grab it, and I'd pull them out, and I'd have to go motoring in there. But anyway, we caught a whole bunch of bass. I got back that night, and I asked Bobby Murray how he did. He said, oh, I didn't do any good at all. We didn't do, can't catch anything. I said, man, I went to Colville Bay, got into those big salt cedars that grow in those big flat pockets. And we could, Bob, Bob and I caught like 20 pounds of piece, 20, just a big old string of bass. And, and he said, well, you're going to win the tournament, Roland. I said, well, I hope so. He said, well, is there any place that I can fish? And I said, I'll tell you what, Bobby, this is the guy that wins the tournament now. I said, do you take these other three coves? Bob, Bob Pons and I are going to fish those four or five coves that we fish today. But you can have, there's another couple of coves back there. And you can have them. Well, that's where Bobby went. That's where Bobby won the tournament. Like a dummy, I gave him the fish, more or less, and the pattern and everything else. But he capitalized on it. He's a very good fisherman. It wasn't that I made him win or anything. I just gave him the opportunity to, to catch fish, and that was a big deal. I did catch the big fish in the tournament. I caught a six-and-a-half-pounder. I think I came in third or fourth. I came in pretty high, but I didn't win the tournament. Anyway, so that was the first kind of one that I, I should, I could have won. I mean, I don't know that I would have won it, but if I hadn't given it to Bobby, <laughs> I think I would have probably gone to those other coves and I think I, I would have probably, probably done pretty well. Okay, so that was the first one. The next one was another deal that we fly into a place. It's called Clark's Hill Reservoir on the Georgia, South Carolina border. And Bill Dance was there and Ray Breckenridge. He was actually the winner of the tournament. And I remember at the time, what we had, we had a deal where the, the, the uh, outdoor riders would fish with us. They'd all go with us. And I happened to draw the number one outdoor rider in the country, Homer Circle. Homer Circle. He was the angling editor for Sports of Field, the number one guy. He was just a really good guy. I'd already worked with Homer because a couple of years before, I'd worked with uh, Glenn Lau and some of the guys, and, uh, and we'd done some film work together. So I knew, I knew, I knew Homer. But anyway. That's a long story. So, so Homer said, okay, Roland, uh, let's, you know, let's go. He didn't, he didn't fish hard. So that morning, the first morning was foggy. Well, I'd gone, I'd gone up this fish, it was called Fishing Creek, I think it was. And I got to the back end of it, it the day before in the actual warm-up, and I found the creek channel. It was kind of out in the, in the cove. If you went too far back in the cove, you couldn't get into it because of the, of the berm. But there were bushes out in the cove, and if you went out into the cove, out in the middle of the cove, you could get into the creek. And boy, it was just full of bass. I mean, I made a cast of spinnerbaits, I made a cast of jigs, I made a cast of crankbaits, and I caught five or six nice bass. And I, and I, I, I told, oh, I forgot who I was with that day. I said, man, I'm going to win this tournament. First day of the tournament, I draw Homer Circle. We, I'm a boat number one. I'm the angler, angler of the year that year as well. And so I, I run back into the, into the pocket and I run back into Fishing Cove and I miss, you know, we didn't have GPS then. We didn't have any kind of really good way to, uh, to, to navigate. We had a, well, we didn't have GPS. We had a compass is all. And in the fog, I couldn't see the bushes out in the middle of that cove. And I missed the bushes. And, and I got way in the back and I heard some other boats kind of coming behind me. And Ray Breckenridge, one of, the, one of the top guys, the guy that won the tournament, he goes right, he finally gets in there, and he goes right into that cove. I said, that on rails in the cove. He's in that, in that creek that I wanted to go in because I was in, here first, and I would have gone in there. Well, I get in behind him. 
And Ray was up ahead of me about 100, 100 feet or so, and he's, I see him catch one, a nice one. I catch a little one. He catches a nice big one. He catches another one. Anyway, at the end of the day, Rayo had a nice little limit, about, you know, 10 or 12 pounds, and I only had three or four fish. And Rayo came up to me. We had a code of ethics then. This is, I'll tell you what the code of ethics was. And this is kind of the way we operated then. Rayo came up to me and he said, Roland, he says, you know, uh, I got in that cove before you did. I got in that creek before you did. And he said, uh, I caught more fish than you did because I, I was first in there. And he said, uh, you know, what do you think? Do you think, can you give me that, that creek again? I mean, I wanted to go in there and keep fishing it. Well, our code of ethics was, you know, if somebody gets in there first, they get rights to it. And I said, okay, Rayo, that's a good deal. I'll go ahead and honor that, and I'll, I'll let you fish that creek. Well, he goes in the creek because I let him go in the creek, and I didn't pressure him. He goes in the creek and wins the tournament. It's as simple as that. Uh, the second day, I, I, I caught a few fish, and I, I placed pretty high. I think Bill Dance came in second. I was in the top ten. But anyway, I didn't win the tournament. But it was because of, of the camaraderie we had. It was because of the, of the fact that we honored each other's water and we worked together and we had, we had, a, 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 we had a, a, I don't know, we just had an understanding that we wouldn't rob each other's water. If somebody got in there first, it was his water. Okay, so that kind of worked out. And that, I, th I, th I thought later, you know, that would have been an opportunity. I could have won that tournament pretty easily. Well... The next kind of big one was uh, Wheeler Reservoir. Now, at the time, I mentioned Wheeler Reservoir was like the third or fourth uh, Blastmaster Classic. At the time, the, the outdoor riders could fish. So I go out the first day of the tournament, and, uh, and, 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 and I, I had some kind of outdoor rider with me, and I went down the stump roads by, by uh, uh, Decatur, Alabama, I mean, the first day of the tournament. I can't who, remember who my partner was. And I'm leading the tournament. I catch a six and a half pounder. I catch a five and a half pounder. I catch a couple more on crankbaits. I'm actually leading the tournament. I'm number one going into that second day. Well, the second day, boy, I'm really hot now. Now, Tommy Martin ends up winning the tournament. I just want to tell you what happened. The second day, I get in there and it's a, a, <laughs> I go to the stump row again and, and I catch a few fish and, and I, dropped, I dropped down from a second to about fourth or fifth. I, w I wasn't quite, uh, I think Tommy was a couple, two or three pounds ahead of me. The last day comes and I draw a guy by the name of Henry Reynolds. Now back then, the outdoor riders could fish with us. In fact, they won big prizes and stuff. And if they caught a big fish, they, uh, they'd get like a thousand dollar prize if they caught the fish while we're practicing. Well, see, you know how practice is. You know, you shouldn't be catching fish in practice and, 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 you know, that's, we don't try to do that. We try not to catch fish, just to kind of shake them off. But anyway, in the regular tournament, here he is in the back of the boat catching. He's throwing right up ahead of me, and he's kind of throwing all over top of me. And we, we I go down the stump rows again, and I don't catch but a, one or two. I get to the, the big, there's big power lines across the lake, down about, uh, it's near the Declator Flats. It's in the upper end of the lake. And these big power lines have big piles of rocks around them, a big, huge rock pile around each of the four legs. And these legs are about 50 feet apart because these are great, big, huge electric uh, towers that go up and carry big, big electrical uh, lines that clean across the lake. And there's a couple of them out in the lake. But anyway, I pull up to the one in like a dummy because I'd caught a couple of fish there, I think, the, the first day before, but the wind's just right. Here's the problem. As I pull into the first place to fish, the other three pilings, or here's one and there's one, there, are, are in the back of the boat, and that's where Henry is. Henry's in the back of the boat. He takes a little crankbait, he throws the one up, bam, he catches a four-pounder. I mean, this is like really big. It's like almost enough to put me in the lead. I catch a little one. He throws back to another. He catches a one of five pounds. He's got a five-pound fish. I said, man, I can't believe it. Now, he's, he's in competition with me now. I'm trying to win the classic and I'm just a couple pounds away from the lead and he's catching a four and a five pound fish he catches another couple I catch a couple finally I pull around where he can't like a dummy I shouldn't have done that I should have I should have pulled around the other way and fished him one at a time where I could throw first and, and up ahead but I didn't I let him make a couple casts of the ones I wasn't fishing and he ended up 
catching the big string of the tournament. Of course, he won $1,000, and he was all happy because he had a big, giant string. He had a bigger string than anybody. But anyway, I would have won the tournament. If, I had, if I'd caught the fish that Henry Reynolds had caught the last day, I'd have won that tournament. Yeah, that, was, that was my own fault for, for not letting... For letting him fish, like I, I mean, I could have cut him off. I could, I could have been real kind of sn sn snotty about it. But he was one of these guys. I want to uh, give me a place to fish. Give me, and he didn't need to be doing that. It was just a Bassmaster Classic. Anyway, that was the third one, and I really kind of lost. I lost out on that deal big time. Okay, the St. Lawrence River. And I came in second place on the St. Lawrence River, and everybody said, "Oh, that's really good," but that's not the story. The story is, okay. We'd raised so much cane, and, and the fact that Henry Reynolds caught all these bass on me, I raised so much cane to Ray Scott, they changed the rules. And the rules that year, it was about the fifth year of the tournaments, or sixth or seventh classic. Again, a fly-in deal, Mystery Lake, all that kind of thing. But <laughs> the anglers, or the outdoor riders, couldn't fish the days of the tournament. The only day they could fish was in a warm-up. So... So I draw this guy from the, from the Washington Post. Uh, uh, oh, he's a good friend of mine. I can't remember his name right now. But uh, anyway, he, he's in the back of my boat. Well, I'm going along, and I'm, sp I'm just trying to spot fish. I'm, just, I'm looking down in the water with my polarized glasses. I can see that there's real clear water in the St. Lawrence, and I'm looking at rocks and boulders all back in, around Alexandria Bay and some of those uh, places like uh, uh, Lake of the Isles and all those. I'm back in all those really neat places. I'm seeing these boulders. Anyway... I see this great big bass on this boulder. It's a giant. I don't want to say anything to to, to my partner because I'm afraid he'll kill catch it because he's trying to. Again, they'll win turn. They'll win like a thousand dollars if they catch the big fish, but I don't want to let him know what's even there. So I turn the boat around. I see this big fish. I just turn the boat around. Well, here's what happens. By turning the boat around, this is in a warm up. Turning the boat around, he's now back by the rock and he makes a, a blind cast. Doesn't even know the fish is there. Catches a six and a half pound bass. The biggest bass that would have been the biggest bass of the whole entire tournament. And he catches it in the warm-up, which is I was trying to save it. I was trying to get away from there so I could catch it the next day, but I didn't do it. So anyway, in the warm-up, I went to another spot called uh, the Mary Island Ledge. Now, this is really a big deal. There's a ledge, and in, 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 it's at Mary Island right outside of Lake of the Islands, and there's a crack in there. There's a crack about this wide. I'd taken my jig, and I'd cut the hook off. And I'd taken a pair of pliers and cut the hook completely off. And I had the Polaroid glasses I could see real good. And this is, a, again, a, a day with uh, Gene Mueller was an outdoor writer from, uh, from uh, the Washington Post, by the way. Gene Mueller had, was cast, and I, I, threw a, I threw a jig in there. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I see this great big bass, about six pounds, come rising up to the jig. This is in the practice. And I shake it off. I shake him off. I shake him off. I shake him off. I pull the jig out. I said, okay, get out of here, Gene. He had already caught the big bass. He already had it in the live well. I said, I'm gonna, don't throw in there. And he didn't throw in there. So anyway, the first day of the tournament comes along. I go to this other rock pile. Bam, I'm leading the tournament. I, it's a windy day. It's blowing in on, the, on that Mary Island ledge. I can't even fish there. But I do have the leading string. I got 20-something pounds of bass. I got a big old string of bass. I'm number one in the tournament. And I'm also angry of the year that year. So I had a, a, big, a big deal. I had boat number one. Well, anyway... Long story short, uh, Bo had been catching a few fish, and he was, uh, the Bo Dowd ended up winning the tournament. Let me tell you how it happened. The second day, I go out and catch another bunch of fish, and now I'm still leading the tournament. And so it's the third day of the tournament. I'm in the lead. I just need to catch another good, solid bunch of fish. I go to my couple other places. I don't do too well. But I know that if I can catch that big fish that I shook off on Mary Island on that little crack and crevice when I was with Gene Mueller, I know if I could catch him, I could do it. So it gets to be about the time that I figured it's about right. The shadows are just right, and it's, it's just right. And, and, and so I, I start to run there, and like a dummy, I stopped just on this little point. Well, another boat ran kind of around the corner, but it was bowed out. But anyway, I, I, finally, I finally cranked my boat up. Okay, it's time to see if I can't catch that big fish on Mary Island Ledge. I'll win the tournament. Just as I... Just as I get there, I see a boat running out. It was a boat out, but he was running out of that area. When I got to the big rock, there's a little aluminum boat there. And I started to make a cast, and, and the guy said in the aluminum boat, he said, you should have been here five minutes ago. I said, well, what happened five minutes ago? He 
He said that boat that just left, he just caught a great big bass, about six or seven pounds, right there in that crack in the, in the rock. I said, what? Sure enough, Bo Dowden had been there five minutes before, like a dummy. I'd stopped just a minute before. I'd stopped somewhere. Bo had gotten in there just on a blind deal. I don't think he had had it found. Threw in there and caught the very same bass that I was trying to catch. Now, if I'd caught that bass, of course I would have won. If I'd gone in there and, and just scared the bass where Bo hadn't even, it wouldn't have caught it, then I would have still won. Or if I had caught the bass that Gene Mueller had caught the first day, I would have won. So there's three ways I would have won. But the last way it happened, Bo Dowden caught the bass and he won. I came in second place just a pound away from the winner. Anyway, that's, that's the kind of bad luck you get. And that's the kind of thing. You, go, you know your patterns. You know what to do. You know where to go. But you never know about the other guy that's fishing. And so that's, that's the one ingredient in these tournaments that's always messed me up. I never could figure out what everybody else was doing, and they always got in my way and caused a big problem. Okay, Mississippi River Delta. <laughs> Mike Iconelli wins that one. I'd gone down with my son Scott in the warm-up, and not only had I caught some beautiful bass, but I caught the biggest redfish ever. I was taking a flipping stick, and I was taking a big jig, and I was flipping in all these pilings and stuff, and I set the hook one day. I caught a 50-pound Redfish among the, that was the biggest redfish I ever caught in my life. I was with my son Scott, but we caught, we went to Delta Ducks and we found a bunch of bass. We found these two canals, a North Canal and the South Canal. The North Canal had a split in it, and I went to the split and I'd taken a worm and thrown right to the split of the thing. Bam, I caught a four and a half pounder in the warm up with Scott. I said, Scott, this is a fantastic place. Plus, I caught two or three more fish. I said, I, can, I think I can really do well in the tournament. And I don't know if I can win it or not, but I think I'll do good. Okay. So <laughs> I'm thinking of that north spot. I'm thinking of that the ditch. I'm thinking of that, that spot. Maybe if I release it, maybe I'll catch it again another day. Anyway, the tournament starts. By that time, we didn't have outdoor riders that fished. By that time, the outdoor riders were sitting there just as observers. They didn't fish. We had all the time in the world to do anything. I go into the South Canal. I take a buzz bait. Man, I'm hammering them. I'm, I don't leave the tournament that day, but I'm in second place. I got about a big old 15-pound sack, and I even lost another big one. And anyway, it was just so good. I don't know where Mike Iconelli had fished the first day. He, he caught a bunch of fish, but I was ahead of him going into that first day. So the second day comes along. Same kind of deal. I'm doing really good. I think uh, Mike and I are close to having about the same weight. I'm not sure just how, how many pounds he had. But I'm in the top two or three. I was uh, second the first day. I think I'm third the th second day or Something like that. So the last day comes along. And I don't know where Mike Iconelli is fishing. I just know that I got this North Canal and the South Canal. Well, as it turns out, like a dummy, I was going to go to the North Canal because I'd been saving it for, for the last day. I said, boy, if I can go in and catch that big four and a half pounder I caught with my son Scott, I might win the tournament. Plus, there's a bunch more fish there. But like a dummy, nobody was behind me. I, I couldn't didn't see anybody coming. Like a dummy, I went into the South Canal just for a minute. I mean, caught one fish and heard a boat kind of running back. And he's only, these canals are real close together. I could hear somebody in there talking. It's Mike Iconelli. He'd gone into that North Canal or South Canal. And just about the time I said, I'm looking at my map and I'm seeing right about where he is. And I got my map in front of me and I'm seeing that little juncture and I can hear him talking. He's just across the Rozos from me. All of a sudden, I hear him yelling and screaming. You know how Mike is when he catches the big fish. He goes crazy. He jumps around, does break dancing on the deck, and he does all kind of crazy stuff. Anyway, I hear him yelling and screaming and screaming and hollering. He'd caught that four-and-a-half-pound bass. He'd, I think, I don't know if it was the same bass, but it was another big one just like that. And it was a big bass. The point was, and I looked at the map, it's exactly where I wanted to go. It was the exact spot that I thought I could, I could go in and catch, and catch a fish. So anyway, I, I think I came in fifth place in something in the classic, so at that, that particular time. But the point is, these are these, I'm not taking anything away from Mike. I'm not taking anything away from Bo Down. I'm not taking away from these other anglers that end up winning. It's just that I screwed up. I, I could have had that north spot, that south spot, instead of, instead of Mike Iconelli, and the chances are, I would have either caught the fish and won, or I would have scared the fish away, and if Mike had gone in there, maybe he wouldn't have won. 
I don't know. I don't know what would happen. But the point is, I screwed up. I didn't go there. I knew my patterns. I knew my uh, where to go. I just didn't figure what happened when you put a, another bunch of anglers in there on top of on top of all that. Anyway, that's just a few things. There's two or three more uh, instance, instances just like that where I could have won the tournament. I should have won the tournament. Uh, but yet, I never did win a Bassmaster Classic. But those many times, at least six or seven times, I came real close. Anyway, hey, that's kind of my story for today. And I, I get all excited thinking about all the opportunities I had. To, to win a tournament. You know, I, I won a lot of tournaments and I don't think about them. I always think about the ones I didn't win. And that was uh, the case of the Bassmaster Classic. Hey, thanks for watching this, this little episode. I know my people at O'Reilly's will be happy. The Bass Pro Shop people, my Spunkin' people, my Frog Dogs people, <laughs> my, everybody, my, all my uh, Spro people. I, I tell you what, I got some great sponsors, great advertisers. And, they, and they, it all kind of goes with, with the likes and the hits that we get. I get contracts and things like that to keep going, and they're all happy when you hit that likes button or subscribe, either one. Hey, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon.